Welcome back to another episode of One on One with Mitch LaFon. I am your host, Mitch LaFon, and sitting with me again is Talking Metal host, Mark Striegel. Good day, sir. Good day, Mitch. How are you today? Good. Uh, you know, it's always fun doing these episodes with you, and... Uh, what I Absolutely. think is even more exciting is that now we're out on iHeartRadio and on Stitcher and on Spreaker and iTunes. It, it seems to be growing. So. Yes, and hopefully, I just got an email from TuneIn. It sounds like we'll hopefully have the show up there very soon, maybe even by the time you're hearing this. So I'll, I'll keep you and all the listeners posted on TuneIn. Yeah, that's great. And of course, you know, you and I have been talking to the folks who run the Heavy Montreal Festival and, of course... You know, the, uh, the festival takes place in August. Next one is August 215. But we might be able to bring you some heavy Montreal-related content in the next month or two and keep that sort of machine rolling. So that's also very exciting because it is the premier heavy metal festival in North America, at least Absolutely. according to me. And yeah, of- I mean, I think according to you and, and most people, anybody who's been there, I mean, you forwarded me that video of the, the metal, metal injection, injection guy. Yeah up there and they they said the same thing i mean and they're you know they're new yorkers they're very tied into what's happening and heavy metal and you just can't beat that i mean the only place you're going to get a festival maybe as big as it i'm not even sure but is you know is over in europe i mean it's just you can't compare to that festival it definitely not in north america yeah you know i think i think in terms of festivals Wacken over in Germany is still the metal festival, I think, e- even though I hear that, you know, you have to sleep in the mud and the, it's still the one that you have to go to. But I think really yeah. this one in Montreal, heavy Montreal, is starting to be that next destination. But if festival. you compare lineups and no disrespect towards Wacken, but for me personally, if you compare lineups, uh, heavy Montreal 2014 and Wacken 2014, Heavy Montreal just crushes the Wacken lineup. Oh, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Dude, because, amazing lineup. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I th- Wacken is very cool, but they do go sort of for that, no offense to anybody, but that B-list, C-list kind of metal artist, whereas Heavy Montreal just brings you all the fucking gems. I mean, they just yep. bring you everything. And uh, listen... 2015. I, I, I wish it was August again now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, right I mean, on. you know, uh, let's bring it on. Uh, who knows who's going to be there? there? There are so many great bands that are metal or hard rock that haven't played it. You know, Sabbath hasn't played it. The Scorpions haven't played it. Uh, Judas Priest hasn't played it. Though Rob Halford did. Um, uh, you know, Iron Maiden coming back would be good. so. Let, ACDC. Let's. Fingers crossed. Let's, let's yeah, see Yeah, fingers comes crossed. Up. Fingers crossed. Sure. And speaking of festivals, let's get, remind the folks that this episode of One on One is brought to you by Melodic Rock Fest 4, taking place, August, uh, sorry, taking place October 3rd and 4th. In our, so yeah, I got all tied up in talking about August. And that's how excited I am about heading yeah. Montreal. <laughs> but uh, Melodic Rock Fest 4 takes place August... Uh, I'm going to keep saying it. You want to say it for me? October. There you go. October... 3rd and 4th in Arlington Heights, Illinois, and features performances by Mitch Malloy, Heaven's Edge, one of your childhood favorites, I would think. Yes. Um, Seventh Heaven, Talon, Paul Lane, Bombay Black, Johnny Liba, many, many more. Head over to MelodicRockFest.com and do yourself a favor and head over to MelodicRock.com, which is uh, Andrew McNeese's site who has put together Melodic Rock Fest for and do me a favor and head over to iTunes and check out the A World with Heroes EP Kiss Tribute with new performances recorded in 2014 by uh, the Killer Dwarves featuring Bruce Stephen Foster, who was the original piano player on Nothing to Lose on the Kisses album 40 years ago, uh, Dick Wagner, Matt Bradshaw, and many more. All the money going to the Vaudreuil Soulange Palliative Care Home in Hudson, Quebec. So there you go. Cool. So let's and get who's to, on the show today? Well, let's get to that. Um, yeah. We've got an outsider. We've got Mick Box of Uriah Heep. And of course, nice. I just call him the outsider because their new album, their 24th studio album, I mean, that's wow. unbelievable, is called Outsider. And uh, as they like to say in England, Mick rang me up and uh, we had this wonderful conversation about what is the seminal Uriah Heep album, uh, all, of course, about the new album, 
uh, why they do so well in UK and Europe and other territories and why sometimes it's a, it's not as, um, easy going in the North American market. Uh, yeah. we talk about his gear. We talk about just a whole bunch of stuff. Um, just a great, great, uh, chat, absolutely wonderful chap. And, uh, this interview was postponed from August 4th. That was the day I had Mick all scheduled. I was about to make the call and my heart went into fibrillation. I ended up in the hospital. Oh, so uh, not only did I cancel the interview on him, I wasn't able to warn him. And then, you know, when you blow off an interview, it doesn't look good. But I explained the situation and he was just so kind and so courteous to uh, not only rebook, but rebook in a uh, very rapid, you know, without delay. And uh, we just had a great chat. So, you know, personal thank you to Mick Box for being uh, so very understanding and, for the lack of a better word, cool about the whole thing. Um, cool. So that was really good. And um, just before we, we listen to Mick, let me just tell you about the second interview. It is with uh, Keith St. John. He sang uh, Calling Dr. Love on my first Kiss tribute with his band Burning Rain that features White Snake's Doug Aldrich. And uh, he got together here with, what's his name, uh, Jeremy Brunner, sorry about that, and James Lomenzo of White Lion. And they put together this little band called X-Drive. And it is this very sort of California, 80s, hair metal-ish rock. And I got to say, it's a guilty pleasure. I listened to the album, and I had no expectations. I thought, okay, well, let's see what this is like. And I really enjoyed it. It's, it's, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to make it sound insulting, but it's like candy, cotton candy for the ears, and it's, nice. it's. I think it's worth picking up. I mean, if you like Def Leppard, Bon Jovi, White Lion, and all those Absolutely. bands, you are going to like X Drive. It's uh, out now on Frontiers, and of course, the album is called X Drive. Get your rock on. So, um, why don't we just dive into yeah. Mick Box of Uriah Heap talking about their new album, Outsider. We are talking with Mick Box of Uriah Heap. Good day, sir. Hello, mate. How you doing? Good, good. I'm surviving. Speaking all the way from London here. <laughs> yes. All the, you know, the, the internet and, and, and Skype and all that, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Montreal to London, and it's only going to cost me about four cents. So <laughs> you got to love that. Um, but you, you listen, we're, we're here to talk about Outsider. Uh, yes, mate. Yeah, the new CD, yeah? The new CD uh, released by uh, Frontier uh, Records and produced by Mike Paxman. You know, what, what I find remarkable, especially in this day and age with, with downloads and iTunes, and you can get one song at a time, is, and it might be a strange question, but, but why make an album? Why not just throw out a couple of songs and you know, have people pay 99 cents for it and off you go? Why, why bother making 12 songs? Yeah, if I'm perfectly honest, I think it's just in their DNA, you know. Right. <laughs> it's something we have to do, you know. It's something we want to do. Um, and we just can't pamper to the fact that, you know, maybe only one track will be downloaded, et cetera, et cetera, you know. There's still a lot of people out there that still love hearing, you know, an album in its whole entirety. And um, and we'd rather go with that ourselves, you know. Right. Does that change your approach to album making, though? Do you think of it as 12 uniquely independent songs that can be downloaded and good for you? Or do you still think, wow, we need to make something that has a sequence? We, we, we'll al we will always, in your eye, have an album head. Okay. You know, it's, it's always going to be that way because that, that's how we work and that's how we, you know, we operate, to be honest, you know, and that's what we're comfortable in doing. We can't ever think of, you know, we need this, we need that, you know. I think when you start analyzing, you start losing the edge on everything you do. Yeah. So we just let everything flow, um, you know, very naturally. And we get in one room and we play. And we, we play in, in the same room when we record, you know. So it's like, you know, all the bands in there fired on all the five cylinders, if you like. And um, there's no safety net. We just we do the take and that's the backing track done, you know, in one, one recording button. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's, let's get a little bit into the, into the songwriting process and the putting together. Sure, you know, sure. If, if you look back at Uriah Heep and, and any band, Kiss, Aerosmith, all that back in the 70s, you were doing sometimes two albums a year, and now yeah. we don't do that. So, so what, what has changed over the years, and how did you approach this record? I think in those, in those days, I think that um, we had major investment 
in the band, you know, with, with managers, etc., and and record companies, there was a major investment going on, and and with that major investment, it was you know get out there and do it, and it was kind of like that, you know. So we was constantly on the road, and when we weren't on the road, we were in the studio. So um, it was great for us, you know, because creativity-wise, it was it was it was perfect because um, we like moving, you know, fast. We like recording fast. We're not the band, sort of band that that goes in and spends a year, you know, making an album. You know, we do it in, in two or three months, and we're quite happy with that, you know. So, yeah, it, it was uh, it was one of those. It was driven, driven like that, really. You know, you, you had to be out there. You had to be in the game. You had to be moving forward, moving right. fast, and paying back the loan. <laughs> it's basically it. Yeah, that, that your, your, your favorite word must be recoupment, right? Recoupment is the word, yeah. I'm, I don't, I'm not sure we ever got there. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was basically it. You know, it was a great investment to get us where we were, and therefore, you know, we were driven to to produce that many albums and to to work that hard. You know. Yeah. Now, now with uh, the release of Outsider, um, how important does it become to get on the road and actually present the new songs to an audience? Well, first of all, we're never off the road. You right. know, we we do um, up to 150 shows a year, no matter what year it is. And um, so, we, you know, we're constantly on the road. We're playing 50, 59 countries. And um, so it's, it's part of what our, our natural life is, you know. Right. And and um, I always say that uh, um, Happy Band's, you know, a band that's, that's working. And uh, you look at your eye, every one of our faces, you're smiling, you know. Because <laughs> we're always out there doing it. So it's very important to get out there and, and, and do it. Because nowadays... If you look at it from a financial, you know, end alone, mm -hmm. you know, there's no money to be made on record sales now that like I used to be. You know, the whole right. structure of that is all fallen to pieces, and so um, the only sort of um, income one can get is out on the road. Right. And then where where that falls down is that you know everyone realizes that, so the place is just absolutely saturated with touring bands. Yes, sir. You know, any one week you can get you know twelve bands through come through the city. You know. So um, th then you have to find something special that stands you apart, and of course, a new album always, you know, refocuses thing into your your world, and and out into the real world, and and therefore you get you know, a reason to be out there and play new stuff. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because you're you're the only original member still standing after what yes, for uh, yeah. forty one years, forty two years, whatever it is. I don't uh, count. <laughs> yeah, well, since about what sixty nine, seventy, so. So the question is, what keeps you active in your Rye Heap? Why not just go be a, a studio musician or a session guy or Joan, you know, whatever, David Bowie's band? What, what keeps you doing your Rye Heap? And if, the, if there's diminishing returns on album sales and the concert market's too crowded, why not just say, eh, you know what, it's been a good 40 years, let me, let me just retire to the countryside? I think it's quite simple. I've still got the same passion and energy for what I do that I always had, you know, and, and that's what drives me. Okay. You know, and, and the fact that we do have a, a fantastic fan base around the world. And um, and I think, you know, people say to you, well, you know, are you going to retire if that's the sort of area you're going into? Well, you, you don't really retire. And you only retire when there's no audience for you. Right. You, you know, and, really we're lucky anyway. enough to have, you know, a, an audience in 59 countries plus. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's a very healthy place to be in your right at the moment. It really is, actually. Uh, I want to talk to you about some of your, your past members, if possible. Sure, um, yeah. <laughs> back in the, in the early 80s, coming right out of Ozzy's band, you had Bob Daisley and Lee Kerslake. Yes, mate, yeah. What was it like to have those guys in the band? And, of course, Lee stayed with you up until about five years ago, seven years ago. Yeah, um, well, I had, I had Lee in the band uh, for many, many years before he went off with Ozzy. Right. Oh, that's right. um, so he was with you before that. That's right. Yeah, so so we were like brothers, you know, and it, it was you know, we we were just uh, um, the perfect team to be out on the road. You know, we did everything together. We got in the trouble together. We drank together. We did everything together, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like one does. And and so yeah, we had this great kinship. But you know, but then um, Lee decided he had enough with our management, to be honest, and he moved on. And then he got the Aussie job. And um, funny enough, I was I was uh, ringing up Lee because I, I, knew, I knew, knew he was going to America with with us, right. and I was phoning him up, you know, because I thought the night, uh, you know, the night before he was leaving, and, and to wish him well. And he says, "I'm not going." So I said, "Oh, what's happened there, mate?" And he said, "Well, Sharon's decided she wants an all-American band." Which is too bad. So I said, oh, well, that's, that's a bit sad. And I, at that time, I just folded up the version of your I that, that recorded the Conquest album. You know, mm -hmm. with um, John Sloman and, wow. and uh, Chris Fade and all that stuff. So I kind of went, well, as it happens, I'm just um, 
putting the whole heap thing together again. But you wouldn't have to deal with the management, who was Jerry Bond at the time, because um, I'm looking after the whole deal. And I've got a record company, and I've got tours, I've got record, you know, the whole thing's going, you know, all singing and dancing. Are you interested? He said, in a heartbeat. So he came over, and I said, well, actually, <laughs> what about Bob? What's he doing? Is he doing nothing? I said, give him a call. I gave him a call, come up, we met, and we, we got a long house on fire. And that was the nucleus of the, the new band that actually recorded the Abominog album. But, of course, we're in top 40 in America, and we had great success, and went out and toured with... Uh, Def Leppard, because they were the wow. biggest things sliced bread out there, you know, in America, and that was great, you know. So it was another rebirth of the band. Yeah, and of course, uh, Joe Elliott Lee famously said that uh, touring with Uriah Heep was one of his best experiences, or you were one of the best bands to tour with. So, uh, how was it uh, touring with Def Leppard back in those early days? I mean, they, like you said, they 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 sort of were the the hot commodity. Oh, it was just amazing! Amazing to see their climb of sixty you know, to success. It was wonderful. Um, uh, they were heady days for them, you know, and, and it was it was good to see. And they kind of liked us being there because they could, you know, we could lay on some experience to them as well, you know, um, uh, some of the pitfalls and etc. 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 And uh, and they always listened listened well and, and took the advice, you know. And they're, they're, they're great, great guys. You know, in fact, I always if, if anybody asked me what was the best band we ever toured with. Uh, on a long tour, it would definitely be Def Leppard. What, what what made it special? I think because there was a, a um, I think there was a bit of a um, respect on both sides. Okay. Number one, um, they were big fans of the band. Number two, the fact we were English in America <laughs> helped a little, you know. And um, and I think there was just it just it just clicked. There was just a chemistry there. Yeah, there really was. Uh, let's talk about America compared to Europe. It appears to me, you know, sitting here in Canada, that Uriah Heap is massive in Europe and that in, in the U.S. and in Canada, you've got a very cult fan base and a very loyal fan base, but it's not the same. Is that a misconception or, or how do you explain sort of the, 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 the dichotomy between the two markets? I don't know. It's, it's very strange. And I think, um, I think the problem nowadays is to tour America, you, you know, I think in England. Right. When we play Europe, um, we generally, you know, we're at home for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we're out playing festivals or whatever all over Europe, and then we fly home. And, and most American bands do the same thing. They, they fly and do the weekends and then fly home. But when we come over to America, we have to keep our entourage and everyone over there. Um, so, therefore, it becomes a, a bit of a financial push to do so because you know you, you, if you've got 10, 10 people in the band and crew you've got 10 hotels you've got you know wages to pay you've got pds to pay etc etc all those things so those ongoing expenses so it gets very hard though because the, the agents can fill up the weekends lovely with casinos and festivals and all sorts of, but during the week it gets to be a bit of a tough call so you end up playing in um some very strange places <laughs> yeah. yeah you really do <laughs> so um but that, that's 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 the tough part of it you know because when once we're out there we, we need to we need to work at least you know six days a week yeah you really do to, to make it make it viable absolutely you know going back to the Def Leppard days and and sort of the mid 80s you had an album called Equator and yes you know it, it's a great album and yet it seemed to get overlooked by CBS Records in the States, and, and they didn't seem to market it, or Portrait Records. They didn't seem to market it like the way they should have. Um, well, that, that's quite simple. I, you know, if I can you know, jump in and tell the story there, it was on the pool track label uh, over here with, C, with CBS, and um, Columbia, the, the label lasted for as long as it took to us to record it and release it. <laughs> <laughs> by the time we released it, the label was gone. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes, therefore, there was no backup with it at all. You know, there was no push, no drive, no advertising, no anything. Yeah. But how do you look back at those days? I mean, was that really a moment lost? Because you had put together this great album that, that fit into what the times were in 85. It, it should have been massive. Was it frustrating? I mean, obviously it was frustrating, but, but how do you look back on those days? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's extremely frustrating, especially at the time, you know, because, you know, you put your heart and soul into an album, you know, and... Um, and, and you expect it to be, you know, uh, uh, given the, the light of day by the record company you know, as much as they want to finance it, finance it. But when it just goes bang, stop, and the door slammed in your face, not because the album is good or bad or indifferent, just because the label's been told to fold up and that's it. 
Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, and there's a brick wall there, and and then then you know you can't really. Um, we couldn't resurrect ourselves within the company itself, you know, because there's nowhere else to go. Yeah, I just I just can't uh, understand. I just as a reporter, I just can't see a musician putting your you know your blood, sweat, and tears into a project, and then somebody else, a third party, just goes, yeah, well, oops. I mean, oops doesn't seem like an answer, right? But that, that, that happens quite often, you know. I mean, when we were, we recorded a bomber dog in the 80s and right. it went top, top fortune in, in the American charts. And uh, we had um, a song called The Way That It Is, I think it was, that we did a, uh, um, a video for. And it was on MTV, a high rotation in those days, eight times a day. And it was all going, flying lovely. And that was all driven by one person in a record company. And um, when we did the next album, Head First, the follow up to that, which mm -hmm. is which is in the same same rock field, you know, it was all all good, some great songs on there, but the guy moved on. And so we lost our contact. And then, of course, the new contact comes in with his own bands, and you get shoved under the carpet again. <laughs> right. He's like, but, you guys should sound life, like Flock of Seagulls, or you should sound like Culture Club. We don't have time for rock here. I mean, that's. that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, looking back at the 24 albums, which one defines Uriah Heep? I mean, if, you, if you're not a fan and you had to go pick up one that was Uriah Heep, the sound, the energy, the vibe, which one are we looking at? Well, if you're looking at you know how they sound today, then obviously outside it would be it. But if you're looking back over the history, I guess the album that was the marker for us would be Demons and Wizards. Right. Be seven, because two. it was the, uh, something that captured everyone's imagination. We were writing very mystical lyrics, which everyone really related to. And many bands took that, from that source and, 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 and took it even further. Um, so we inspired them. But, you know, I, I guess Demons and Wizards was the one, yeah. Lyrically, how has the band changed over the years? Lyrically? Yeah. I think, um, I think we've always tried to write good songs that, that tell a story, okay. you know, and, and have some meaning, you know. Um, I, I get very tired of things, things on the radio that have the, the one slogan that's chanted 50 times in three minutes, you know what I mean? And, uh, and the verses are so weak, you you know, my little boy, my 13-year-old boy could have written them. So I kind of don't like that. So, I, uh, you know, we really put a lot into our lyrics and obviously try and stay away from cliches, et cetera, et cetera, and, 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 um, and, and get a story and something that we hope that connects with people. And hopefully your, 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 audience you, you dream that the audience connect with it, you know, big time, you know. Because so, the, thing, the thing about music is, you know, one song can mean something to one person not to another to another you know they, they all have their own interpretation and that's the beauty of it yeah, yeah. that's where mtv really ruined it for me because they created some, some such a strong image on those dvds and those videos that the, the listeners didn't have time to think no, you, you know you're right I, I go back listening to some of the stuff i was listening to in the 70s you know cheap trick aerosmith and kiss and all that and they have a very special meaning to me but when i look back to cheap trick and aerosmith and kiss of the 80s all I see is those videos in my head. And That's for some right. Reason, yeah. I can't shake it, and I don't. And there's like nothing those worse than having your imagination taken away from you. You yeah. know. Absolutely. You know, MTV was absolutely uh, important or fundamental to the growth of music in the '80s, and it's gone. And you know, it sort of destroyed music in the end. What, where, where do you go now to promote stuff? I mean, is is YouTube? worth it or yeah I, th I think it's all the youtube and facebook and you know all, all the social media sites really isn't it and twitter and all the stuff you know you just um i think you know you have to embrace all those things and and uh, use them to your advantage um but that, yeah, it's, it's generally the way we'd go yeah we yeah, probably uh, yeah i mean like our record company frontiers have got uh, their own web page and their own facebook page and we have as a band and we have as individuals you know right. so you know, you just put it all up on there, and, and hopefully it flies. <laughs> yeah, hopefully it does. Where does uh, where does Uriah Heap go from here? Um, well, we've got to promote this new album, and that's going to take us a good part of two years. But while we're doing that, we'll of course we'll be writing because um, okay. we write constantly. Okay. So that when we um, when we get a gap, we're going to record another album and do it all again because that's what we do and that's what we love to do. Yeah, it's amazing though. Twenty-four albums o over the last forty years. It it, it re really is quite a, a body of work. It's it's. It is, and bad. when I look back at it, sometimes you know it really surprises me. Sometimes I have to say, <laughs> you know, when I'm when I'm in circumstances, I could be in a shop and somebody puts their, you know one of our albums on, or or you know somebody's house or a friend's house or a bar or something. You know, oh, well, that's really good. 
oh, there's us. <laughs> yeah, it's that sort of yeah, that sort of thing, you know. So it's really cool. It's really cool, though. Do you go back and listen to any of the old albums, especially when you're writing a new album, and say, "Ooh, what were we doing on that album in '72? Let me see if I." Or, no, 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 we don't do that. No, um, basically. Um, Every time I listen to the old stuff, if I'm truthful about it, it's when we decide to put uh, another old new number in right. the set list. And, and then, then I'll go back and I'll listen and go, oh, my God, what was I doing there? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, my Lord. Oh, let's go. <laughs> what planet was I on there? <laughs> but, hey, it, it worked out. Uh, let, let me finish with this. Uh, just tell me a little bit about the gear you're using these days and, and sort of the gear you use to make the album. What, what were the guitars? What, what, who's your sponsors, et cetera, et cetera? Okay, well, uh, for guitars, I use a, a company called Carparelli. Right. C-A-R-P-A-R-E-L-L-I. And they're from Canada. Great. And Mike Carparelli is, is the, the, the owner of the company. Um, I've got a good association with him. And, um, and well, basically what it was, I was, I was, I'm a Gibson Les Paul man through and through. And um, I was taking them out on the road because the amount of travel we do, they were getting beaten to death by airlines, you know. And um, it was really, you know, they, they were vintage guitars. So I really just didn't want them to get beaten up. So I, I went on the, the website. Actually, it was a photographer was called Patrick Cussy from England. And he um, said, have you seen these guitars? And I was having a photo session done. And I said, no, no, no. He said, have a look at that site. So he gave me the site. So I looked on them and went, oh, they look really cool. Because they're very, very much like the Gibson Les Paul. Right. And... Um, so I phoned up the company. The company, you know, really pleased to hear from me, sent me over one to England. So I took it on to a man. I sent him guitar tech, like I always do with these things. Um, give, me, give me it for a couple of songs and then just be ready for the other guitar, you know. I'll just give it a little try out. And um, I kept it on for the whole set. Then I kept it on for the whole week. And then I kept it on for the whole month. <laughs> and I went, this is really, really good. So uh, it's good quality workmanship, good quality sound and everything. So... It, it fit me perfectly. So um, we got this relationship together and then you sent me over a few more. And um, I've been delighted with the company. They're, they're great, great guitars. Um, well, uh, real class. Is each guitar handmade just for you or, or does it sort of come off the... No, no, they're just, uh, you know, off, off the production line. Nice. Oh, so there you go. Yeah, um, I, I don't think I could put my name to anything if I, if I went that route, you know. I, I think it's great that, you know, you, you, you can pick it off like anyone else and it's, it's yours, you know. I'll probably, probably the only thing I ever do to it is put a, uh, have, a, have a setup that's specifically for me. Right. But, you know, they're the guitars, uh, Marshall amps, of course. 959 LP is the one in the studio, but I take other stuff out on the road. Um, 4x12 cabinet, usually only use one, um, which is a straight one, not a sloped one. Right. Uh, pedals, I think I've got a Marshall Governor for a little bit of extra drive. Um, and a Quiet Baby Wah Wah, that's it. Yeah, you know, it ain't rock and roll if it's not going through a Marshall. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> That's pretty much it. So, of course, uh, you know, we'll just remind everybody that Outsider is the new album. So, I've obviously got to go check it out. And Uriah... oh, I forgot to tell you, but on the acoustic side, I use Hoffner guitars from Germany. Oh, good. Now, Hoffner was one of the first guitars I ever bought way back when, when I first started learning. So, it's really great to be with that company now, you know. So, that's really cool, too. Yeah. You know, you started, I guess, back in 65. Sorry? You started somewhere back, you started around 1965, right? So you're coming up on your 50th year of active duty. Just about that, mate. Yeah, it's probably a bit longer than that because I was, I was out on, um, I, was, I was playing shows when I was like 14. <sighs> you know, I guess the That's question... where I learned to drink as well. <laughs> <laughs> back in the pub. But, you, you know, after, in those days, yes. <laughs> but after 50 years, is there anything you have to do differently? Because I can imagine that you know, your hand might hurt or your shoulder might... Do you have to approach gigs, gigs differently now? I mean, do you, I think all I, all, all I ever do is warm up a bit. Okay. That's it. I didn't used to do that, but now I warm up for about 20 minutes before I go on. And I have two um, five-pound weights that I just, just, just do a few exercises with just to get the blood flowing, get the energy level up, and then I'm fine. Ah, so that's great. That's great to hear. Mick, this has been a pleasure. Oh, thank you very much, my friend, and thanks for your... Uh, you're cool. It's wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, my mate. Happy days, and hope to see you out there soon. Absolutely. I, I would love to see a Uriah Heap show. Please come and have a beer with us, mate. Be much Absolutely. A, maybe brilliant. Thank you. Cheers, my friend. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye from London. Bye-bye. What you just heard was Mitch's interview with Mick from Uriah Heap. Uriah Heap is one of those bands that 
you know, heavy metal historians, guys like Martin Popoff, for example, mm-hmm. will name right next to, you know, when we think of the godfathers of hard rock and heavy metal, a lot of times we, we say Sabbath, obviously, Zeppelin, Deep Purple, but Martin Popoff has always been sure to include Uriah Heep Absolutely. in that list. And uh, wow, how great to have one of the legends, one of the inventors of heavy metal here on One on One with Mitch LaFon. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the Outsider album, which I've had a chance to listen to for the last month or so, is really great. I mean, they, they did a really great job. And, and it's amazing that a band that started, when was it, 1970? Mm, God, I what, think uh, earlier, 60, no, maybe. 60, yeah, like yeah, 69. 69, right, 69. Yeah. They still have a passion for making new music. I mean, you know, I barely have a passion for getting out of bed, and <laughs> these guys have a passion for, for, for music. I don't even want to do the math on that. Well, actually, it's 45 years. But uh, 45 years later, and they're still going strong. Uh, yeah, you know, cool. C- congratulations to them. And, of course, uh, are they in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Well, no, because they're not hip like Patti Smith or Madonna or Run DMC. Right. God forbid, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, Deep Purple isn't even in the Hall of Fame. So it's just ridiculous. Yeah, let's, let's but, just call it what it is, the Hall of Shame. But let's, let's get over to, to Keith St. John. Absolutely. So, you know, last year I was putting together this uh, tribute for Kiss. Uh, and I think I've mentioned the story before. My wife's father passed away. I wanted to raise some money for the palliative care home that took care of him. And I sent an email over to Doug Aldrich and I said, hey, I've got this Don Dawkin track doing cold gin, blah, blah, blah. Would you play guitar on it? And he wrote back and said, listen, I'm on tour with White Snakes, so on and so forth. But my own band has these tracks back home. They could work it up and then they could send it to me in my hotel room and I could add a quick little buzz to it and off we go. And I said, OK, sure. And so he got Keith and his band Burning Rain to, with Matt Starr, by the way, who's in Ace Fraley's band, to do yes. this track called Calling Dr. Love. And it, it just sounds... And who's also going to be touring with Mr. Big, by the way. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, that's the, 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 the recently announced news. And it's just such a great version. And I had never really... In fact, I had never heard Keith, his voice. And I fell in love with, with the sound, the timbre, the whole thing. And I went back and I bought all the Burning Rain albums. And I checked, out, checked them out with Montrose Online and uh, Lynch Mob and some of the other stuff. And then this... X Drive album came around, and as soon as I saw his name associated with it, I said, I gotta buy it. And I bought it. I didn't get a promo. I actually paid money for it. Right. And uh, I love it. it. It's, again, and I said at the beginning of the show, it's like cotton candy for the ears. Is this gonna change the world? No. Are we gonna revolutionize the wheel? Blah, blah, blah. No. But are you gonna have a fun 45 minutes? Absolutely. And, and yeah, cool. you know, go spend the fifteen bucks and pick it up because it's it's a good and it's probably a one off, you know, because it's not really a band. And Keith has Burning Rain and and Matt, like you said, not Matt. Uh, James has his other stuff. Uh, Matt has Mr. Big, but he's not in this. Um, anyway, I, I think it's fun. So why don't we just listen to what uh, Keith had to say? Let's check it out. We're talking with Keith St. John of Burning Rain, but also X Drive. How are you? How's it going, Mitch? Good. How you doing? Good. Surviving. It's a good. It's a good Excellent. day. I can see you've got the sun out in California, like we do in Montreal today, which is rare. <laughs> nice. Is it blowing me out? Am I okay? No, no. You're perfectly I'm good. fine. I wanted to take you into KSJ Studios today, so you know all my mics and all my crap was up behind me. You could see what I'm where I work, where I record almost all my vocals and everything else. But uh, I got caught up here at home, so we're out on the balcony in the sun. Yeah. Hey. That's a great way to do an interview, don't you think? Much better than the back of a bus or some basement in a bar. I'm loving it, buddy. It's blue skies and it's the San Fernando Valley, although it's it's hot as hell out here sometimes. What what what, what kind of temperature do you have today? So it looks. Uh, I'm going to say it's about 90 sitting here right now in the shade. We're, we're about the same. So so let's talk this X Drive. You know, um, you and James Lomenzo, formerly of Megadeth and White Lion got together with a guy named Jeremy Bruner. Now, if I understand the story, he's a guy out in Oregon who basically just sent out this music and said, can, can somebody record it? I mean, is, is that sort of how the band came together? 
Yeah, I think so. It all really started as a work for hire. Right. And, um, you know, which oftentimes happens. Uh, there's cats that they live in Oregon and remote towns of wherever, and uh, they'll hire guys that, you know, they, they reach out to in Los Angeles or what have you, where there's a lot of, like, rock guys. Right. Specifically, this guy was looking for cats that could make it sound kind of 80s. Yeah. Like, his, his brand of music that he was into, so... He emailed me tracks. I'm sure he emailed James some tracks. And uh, initially, we just agreed, you know, we agreed on a price. And, uh, and that was it. We took off. We didn't really foresee him being so industrious yeah. that he would actually put everything together in a way that he could get a record deal on Frontiers. Which is kind of amazing. I mean, Frontiers was doesn't amazing. find just anybody. I was amazed. Kudos to Jeremy for just coming out of nowhere. And pull in a deal with the world class label. Yeah, that, that handles all these kinds of releases. So that, 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 that's what I find interesting about this release. I've had a chance to listen to it, and it doesn't sound like a work for hire. It doesn't sound like you guys didn't know each other. It actually sounds like you finessed this music in a bar, in the bars, and became a real band. So, so how was the process of putting it all together? From what I understand, yeah, Jeremy already was working on this project maybe five, six years before he came to us. Wow. And I think his frustrations with what was available in his hometown or cities near him with musicians is what finally brought him down, down here to L.A. He spent the money. He came down here, lived in a hotel for a while, kept auditioning guys, I guess, including engineers who could fix the stuff he already had. He re-recorded everything, like, I don't know, half a dozen times. Wow. Everything. And so he's like Axl Rose, you're saying? Well, no, no, no. He didn't. <laughs> I just, no, re- well, re- just keep re-recording everything? No, no, make no mistake. I mean, <laughs> the reason he was doing that was because I think he was disappointed with the result he's getting from the people he was hiring initially to wow. engineer the project. So, you know, he kept kind of, you know, groping his way up the ladder until he got some, somebody who could put it all together. It's funny because Wynn Davis, um, the guy I hooked him up with to mix the record, took, you know, eight-year-old tracks and took tracks that were just laid down and somehow made the whole thing it was kind of like the Fleetwood Mac rumors record you know yeah. went through like three or four different studios and mixed down engineers before it didn't sound like you know an egg you know find, all of a sudden sounded amazing and that's kind of what happened with Jeremy's project and um I was really pleased that it since people were now going to hear it worldwide that it did wind up sounding pretty good so it, it does sound really good happy. now what does it mean in terms of you and, and Jeremy and the guys? Are, are you going to do shows together, or is it sort of this one-and-done kind of thing? Well, you know, that's a tough one. I would say if there's um, some special events and James is into it and all the symptoms are right, you know, the band can adequately rehearse so it goes out, you know, kicking butt. Um, you know, I'd be into it. But, you know, it never really was a band. Okay. It was a guy with his own project. And, um, yes, we did contribute to the writing and whatnot as the project came along. But, um, you know, uh, I don't know. As you can tell, I'm kind of on the fence. I don't, I don't know. Where, where it's going to go. He, he lives where he lives, back oh. up in, in Oregon. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure what the... What the future what his holds. possibilities are, uh, who would book the project. It's a brand new thing. So we'll it's, see. It's hard to get started. Now, if I may, uh, I, I would have wished that the album cover was, was a, little, a little nicer. But, but th- that said, you've worked on other projects before. I mean, I, I was one of those that sort of had you come in for, for this one song on, on a Kiss tribute. Which, yeah, uh, brilliant. Yeah, on, on the A World with Heroes, with your, with your guys from uh, Burning Rain. Burning Rain, yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Burning Rain. Okay, so, so you did this Kiss tribute. You did Calling Dr. Love. It sounded absolutely fantastic. And, of course, last year you had the Epic Obsession album, 
which I had never really heard of Burning Rain before. I, I had heard of you. I had heard of Matt Starr. I mean, I'd heard of Doug, you know, but I hadn't heard of you guys as a band. And then I got Epic Obsession and I went, holy, why don't people know about this band? This is bloody brilliant. So where, what's the future with, with, um, with the band? Are you recording? I mean, was, was the 2013 release the last one? Where, where are we in terms of Burning Rain stuff? No, we've got a number four record in the works. Okay. And we're not really, we don't really have the full assembly of tunes yet. Because Doug and I have a backlog of songs. We kind of, you know, we kind of have like a sort of Van Halen backlog Bald. songs from the early days. And then we write new ones. Like Epic probably had, you know, three or four brand new tracks. But a lot of the rest of that stuff was stuff in the works from, from years ten ago. years ago or five years ago. Or whenever we, we started and then stalled when we were going to write a new record, you know. And we had, okay, out of those six songs, what applies today? So, uh. As soon as we decide to go into production, we'll probably take about, you know, two months to finish writing it and, uh, and get it recorded properly. Is it something that might come out this year or are we looking at 2015? Hard to say. Schedule-wise, I'm going to say 2015. Okay. Now, you know, how does it, you know, getting the band together, Matt is probably going to go tour with Ace Fraley. Uh, Doug does uh, what is it called? Ride, uh, ro- Robin? No, uh, it's raiding the rock. Raiding the vault. Uh, I knew the last part. I, that's that first word. Um, and Sean, what is Sean doing? Is he still uh, doing Great White, or what's he doing these days? Sean has actually been touring with Dokken for a good okay. number of years now. Okay. But Don's taking a break this year, right? And and Don's schedule isn't all that packed, um, or it wasn't last year and the year before. So, and yeah. the nice thing about that camp is. The guys can sub out if they need to. Okay. Uh, oddly enough, when I was in Montrose yeah. for quite some time, um, Sean and Wild Mick Brown were both in the band, too. So when a conflict came up, almost every time they'd do the Montrose gig, because the Montrose gigs were a little bit more rare. Right. And they had their sub guys, you know, covering Don's band. Okay. So... I guess they all have an understanding where that kind of works works where they, out. Where they, where they float in and out. Um, yeah. You also did some time with uh, the uh, Lynch Mob. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. How was it working with George? Easy, easy. Great guy. Love working with him. He's uh, just easy to get along with. Really fair guy. Okay. You know, and uh, no complaints whatsoever. And, and he's fun to play with because he'll jam. You know, he'll just spark it up on stage, and he always just calls. He goes, you're a jammer. Just, I go, George, I don't know that song. He's like, don't worry about it. Just, just jam. Just sing whatever, man. So, and, uh, and it's fun that that works out. You know, not a lot of guys are like that. No, not the, at all. In that genre of music. So, so where does that leave you now? With, with Burning Rain, sort of a 2015 project, with X-Drive not going on tour, what are you working on? Well, I'm working on some KSJ material, um, and I as well have a pretty good back catalog of my stuff, and I feel like the timing right now is pretty good for me. I just uh, sold out my half of a music and dance academy Oh, nice! that I I was the half owner of, married to, quote unquote, for about the last seven or eight years out where I live in the valley in Woodland Hills. And um, a big reason why I did that was so that I had the freedom to pursue my musical right. interests now yeah because owning a business is 24 7 oh god and you Especially can't you can't business. go to yeah you can't go to tokyo and then say hey uh, take care of my dance dude because you come back it's a mess yeah and i did a, a lot of that coming back to a mess while i was doing it so uh and you know it really worked out for me in a couple ways because uh the gal who was my ex-partner lived out of state and was kind of in a in a funky spot. And I called her up and I said, you want to come back and have this studio and buy me out and take it over? Because it's doing pretty good. And she jumped on that and that was that. So it was good karma. And, um, you know, I'm sure that'll come back my direction somehow, some way. And hopefully in record sales in the future. Well, yeah, of course. But, um, but what is happening is Burning Rain's going to Europe, it looks like, in December. Oh, that's great. Rain the Rock Vault is off. They're dark for the month of December. 
Um, there's already been dates announced. I don't know if they're going to switch around a little bit some more. Um, but sometime December, maybe a little bit of January too, we'll be over in Europe. So, it, it appears to me, just from you know following the rock scene, that Burning Rain and newer bands do better in Europe rather than in the states, especially in the rock genre, for lack of a better word. Um, is that your sort of appreciation as well that you're doing a little better in Europe? They just seem to really want rock still. I think so. I would agree with that, and and I think. Uh, I think the attention span is a little bit longer and a little bit broader there in Europe. I think people like to still buy CDs. They like to hold it in their hand. They like to have the artwork. And they like to sit and listen to a record. And I don't know if that's such a, a thing with American fans, you know? I, I don't sense it over here, quite frankly. It comes and goes quickly. And then you have Japan, which there really isn't a rock for, like, Young twenties, no, you know, well, they, have, really, they have it's, baby metal now. It's so pop over there. I mean, everything's so dance and pop. You know, yeah, they do have baby metal, but it's, uh, I don't know, it's limited. Just a wave of the future. Three Maybe. little, three little fifteen-year-olds doing heavy metal. Hey, hey. You know. but so so then, is there a, a Keith St. John solo album coming soon? I'm working on it. I can't really say. I don't have a. I don't have a release date. I definitely, over any of the past years, have gotten some interest from some labels saying, "Hey, you know, you want to do this?" Or you know, they try to pair me up with another guy. Hey, you should get together with such and such up and coming guitar player from you know Sweden. And but I'm like, no. I, if you guys are interested, I kind of want to do my own thing. Yeah. And uh, more than likely. A lot of my friends and cats that I've worked with and sang on their records will come and play on my record. So that'll probably work out in the label's favor as well when that happens. You know? Now, when you do that, is it going to be sort of in that Montrose, uh, Burning Rain kind of vein? Or do you want to do something completely different? That's what I'm working on right now. What foot do I really want to put forward? Because as a writer... I've gone through so many phases. Nice. And even currently, if I sit down and write today and write tomorrow, you know, one thing might sound like it's, you know, full Elton John ballad, just piano. And one thing will sound like something off the Love Drive record by the Scorps or something. You know, yeah. it's like opposite ends of the world. So uh, it'll definitely be rock. It may be a bit of a throwback. Um, it's funny. I am... Um, you know, through Raiding the Rock Vault and other sort of vintage um, projects and things that I've kind of been hovering around and getting involved in, I'm getting back into that real bluesy, hard rock Zeppelin-y sound a yeah. lot. So, I don't know. I could lean that way. The That's... other day, yeah, I did something. I wrote something. It kind of really reminded me of one of those, like, one of those heavy Zeppelin, you know, thud bash, like, wonton tune with... Just a lot of James Brownie scat, yeah, Robert Plancy stuff, and I'm like, this is cool. Will anybody buy this? I don't know. I certainly would. I have to. I have to admit, you know, I really got to discover your voice last year when I worked on that Kiss project, and I'm just amazed that you're not like this massive superstar because your voice is very unique and very powerful, and it's got that bluesy. I mean, it's 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 sort of in that Steven Tyler. It's just great. Thanks, buddy. Wow. It's just great. Well, you know, Mitch, too, I, I had a sneaker for that song, Doc, Calling Dr. Love, because that, that was a song that uh, when, when I was in my parents' basement, I would take their Phonola stereo thing with the, uh, with the fold-out speakers and put it, like, right behind my head so I could hear it over my drumming. Nice. And one of the first tunes I started, like, learning drums to, and, you know, it's pretty basic, uh, pretty basic drum beat and an easy one to get into, and... You know, when you first start playing drums as a kid, you just want to smash everything, you right. know. And I, I started singing along to it, and it was one of those uh, songs that was just with me somewhere down in that, there. It's in the soul. When you mentioned, yeah, when you mentioned Kiss tribute, I was like, "Can we do Calling Doctor Love?" So <laughs> when I sang it, you know, I definitely, I was feeling it, bro. You know? Yeah, and I heard that uh, <laughs> you were mentioning uh, to me before or in the past that you're doing, you, 
you're going to do some cover songs with Burning Rain, so that that one definitely needs to be in there. I think it needs to go to a stage, quite frankly. You know, you know, we did put um, our version of Cashmere on Epic Obsession, and yes. that's been getting good uh, good play and good hits and requests. You know, people that are coming to shows will tweet or Facebook us and go Cashmere, Cashmere. So, and I think I can give you the ultimate um, compliment on that song, Cashmere. My wife is a is a Zeppelin fan. She thinks Robert Plant's voice is absolutely unique, blah, blah, blah. And anytime she hears a cover, regardless who it is, she goes, that sucks, that sucks. And I played yours, and she actually went, hey, that was pretty good. So the fact that she didn't just throw it out wholesale is quite impressive. So she, she connected with what you guys were doing, quite frankly. Nice, And that's nice. that's rare, and I don't want to put my wife down, but... If it's not Robert Plant and Jimmy Page, it's just not worth listening to if it's a Zep cover. But she liked yours. so That's what marriage is supposed to be, right, bro? Yeah. You tell the truth. That's right. <laughs> However you feel, whatever your real opinion is, you know, she's going to hear it and you're going to hear it from her. Yeah. So and, that's and, a good benchmark. And, and she liked it. So I went, ah, good. She likes something I like. Um, so where do we go from here? Where, what, are the, what are the Facebook pages, the Twitter? Let, let's just sort of plug a few things and... Let folks find out more about you and Burning Rain and all those wonderful bands. And X-Drive, of course. Well, definitely um, definitely go out and check out X-Drive. Yeah. It's, uh, it's on the lighter 80s pop metal side. It just is. But yeah. for what it is, I think it's a, it's a decent representation. And once again, I commend Jeremy for all his organization, getting us all together and seeing it through to a point where it sounds good. It's, it's, a, it's a record that sounds legitimate. I quite enjoyed it. I have to say, I quite enjoyed it. I didn't know what to expect. I got attracted to it because I saw your voice and James, who was in White Snake, and of course uh, Megadeth. And it's a fun, summery, pop rock record. It sort of brought me back to the days of Def Leppard and Bon Jovi and and White Lion, quite frankly. And hey, nothing wrong with that. It's perfect for the month of August, September. It's, it's that great roll down the windows kind of thing. So good on him. Yeah, absolutely. So there's that. And I, I don't know what the fate is of that. I, I really don't know enough about Jeremy's plans or the ability for the, that group of people to actually get together. Right. Like what, I'm, I'm, un, I'm unsure about that. I do know that uh, Burning Rain is, is on the burner heavily right now. Um, with Doug having left Whitesnake and doing uh, the Raiding the Rock Vault thing, uh, which really from my understanding, is so that he could be with his son right. and his family most of the time now instead of, you know, out on the road and away from them. Um, well, it's just, you need to make it, it works out for Burning Rain in a way that, yeah. uh, you know, we're coming more to the forefront of his plate as well. So it's going to enable us to do more stuff. Yeah, and, you know, White Snake unfortunately, has to do a lot of their touring in Europe and in Japan. For some reason, the American market's a little bit, a week for for the band right now and so yeah uh, you know when you have a family you don't want to spend your entire summer in france and in you, you want to be next to them california so exactly well hopefully know. this trip to europe will actually prove that we're a live band that we're out there pounding the pavement and the rest of the european uh community the promoters over there will start taking us seriously and next summer you'll see us booked on some some nice festivals and stuff. Yeah, and I'd love to see it. There's a festival up here called Heavy Montreal. I, I definitely think the band should, should get on that bill. It's a, it's a great That'd bill. Great. Hey, we, listen, we had 80,000 people in two days this year. So, come on over. Nice, nice. Come well, on down. Email, so. Absolutely. We'll take Let's care of that. Questions. We'll come out and we'll have a good time up there. Yeah, no, I, um, I'm hoping that once we break up and... Uh, and become something other than just a studio band that uh, suddenly people will start jumping on the Burning Rain uh, bandwagon. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say, for those who haven't heard Epic Obsession, you've got to go get it and go get the Japanese version with the bonus tracks and stuff because they're just killer songs. They're, that's all you can say to it. They're just killer songs. You know? And, uh, you know, Ace Fraley fans who are, who are enjoying this, this beautiful Space Invader... You'll like what Matt did on Burning Rain. Trust me. It's worth it. Good, good guy. One thing I can say about Burning Rain is there's no holes in the lineup now. We're so glad to have Matt around. 
between Matt, Sean, and Doug, I mean, I've got a band that it just is bulletproof. It really is. Well, I mean, the band kicks so much ass. I'm so happy to be out there with those guys. You know, I don't have to look over my shoulder ever. Everybody's got their shit covered, and, uh, yeah, you know, it's right. kind of a dream band. So I'm, I'm really glad when we go out and play live. Yeah, you know, that, that was my first reaction when I heard that Doug left uh, Whitesnake. I went, ah, this will give a chance to Burning Rain, because it's a band that really has something to say. So Yeah, but, I think we, so. We, we need more. <laughs> there you go. Uh, hold on a second. I'll just turn off this recording. And there you have it, folks. That was my interview with Keith St. John of X Drive. Check out the album. It's, it's really worth it. And, of course, let me remind you, speaking of Melodic Rock, Melodic Rock Fest 4 takes place when? October 3rd and 4th. There you go, because I was about to say August again. In Arlington Heights, Illinois, and features performances by Mitch Malloy, who, uh, by the way, tried out for Van Halen back in the day. So head over to YouTube and check out Mitch Malloy Van Halen rehearsals. Uh, and also we've got Heaven's, e- Heaven's Edge, Seventh Heaven, Talon, Paul Lane, many more. Head over to MelodicRockFest.com and also head over to MelodicRock.com. They have great melodic rock news, and of course, they uh, repost both Talking Metal and One on One in their little podcast section, so please excellent check them out, support that. Um, check out TalkingMetal.com, TalkingMetalDigital.com. Check out uh, Mitch's PayPal with a donation. It's MitchMinute at AOL.com. You can support this show by supporting Mitch with a PayPal donation. Again, Mitch minute at aol.com and mitch you mentioned earlier about how you were in the hospital at the beginning of august sure um how are you feeling now can you update the listeners on how you're doing and and uh oh yeah absolutely what's up with you health wise you know uh, ever i'm 46 now ever since uh the age of 29 i was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation so the heart gets all out of whack and uh, the only way that they are able to get me back into rhythm is to electrocardiovert me with those paddles like you were watching that old show emergency 911 right and uh, you know once they do that I feel perfectly fine in fact on August 4th that happened I got out of the hospital after 10 hours went home packed my bags drove over to Saratoga Springs New York to see kiss on August 5th so it's it's more of an inconvenience than actually a health thing. Uh, you know, as as somebody said to me just yesterday, actually, um, you're indestructible. You, you cannot be killed. So, so you know. <laughs> well, you know, we hope not. Yeah. You're not killable, I think it was the word they said. I don't even know if that's a word. but So there you go. No, I, I'm Very perfectly good. fine. We're going to keep bringing you uh, more one-on-ones. And, you know, go support all those people that have us. Head over to iTunes and download it. Tell your friends to, to tune in on Stitcher and uh, iHeartRadio and Spreaker. Once in a while, check out uh, my YouTube page. For example, this Keith St. John interview is a video interview. So I'll throw the raw footage up in, in a few weeks after this runs, uh, you know. And, yeah, of course, uh, Talking Metal and uh, Mars Attacks and the whole thing. And, of course, our new show with Mitch Joel, Metal Raps, which I'm yeah. very, very excited about, actually. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, right. it, because there's no guests on that. It's discussion. It's discussion about the bands that were guests on both Talking Metal and uh, One on One. And I think it just adds a, a unique flavor, a unique perspective. I think it just sort of puts a nice bow on the whole package. Yeah, and they're short little episodes that you can eat up when you're driving or on the train or you you don't really have to devote a lot of time for them. They're all, you know, 10 to 20 minutes long. Yep. And again... get you between two spots. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Good stuff. So definitely check out Metal Raps, part of the Talking Metal digital network. And I guess that'll about do it for today, right, Mitch? That's all, folks.